in their Madrid. So, in general, so I mean, in a nutshell, I will describe a procedure for uh, synthesizing formal specifications of abstract data types, which you can agree with me that in general it's a well-studied problem, but I think that, I mean, the main idea here is that compared to most of the previous work, we'll use a different class of specifications, and uh, the main reason for using this class of specifications actually came from the verification of concurrent objects. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, as a general principle, when we want to reason about, about the program that uses several objects, uh, in order to gain scalability, one, I mean, the verification problem can be decomposed in establishing that those objects implement some given abstract data types, and then checking whether the client code uh, satisfies the property we want using these abstract specifications instead of the concrete implementations. So um, now I will just say a little bit about what we mean by an object implementing an abstract data type. And actually I will consider uh, some definitions that work for both concurrent and sequential objects to also introduce the motivation of our work. So behaviors for us are just simply just sequences of method calls and return. So actually we'll abstract everything about the internal state of the object and about, uh, I mean, what are the actions that are done inside the, the implementation of the object and we'll look just at, at the interface it provides to its clients. So actually here I have, I have an example of an execution where uh, actually some methods are called from different threads, so in this example they will overlap in time. You see these two calls to pop, they overlap. So um, actually even more abstractly we'll think of be object behaviors as histories, meaning as sets of invocations which are partially ordered by a happens before relation. So when, I mean to, in general two invocations are related by this happens before if one finishes before another one starts. So you can see that in this example I have a history that includes some of the operations in the, in the sequence above and you can see that the, for instance the blue operations are ordered since one finished, one returned before the other one was called and also you, if you can see the two invocations of pop, the blue and the green one, they are unordered since they overlap in time, okay? So now this is our model of object uh, behaviors. Now if we, are, if we talk about concurrent objects, actually the, I mean, whether a behavior is correct is typically understood in terms of invocation sequences of abstract data types. Meaning that in general we will say that the history of an object is valid if it has a linearization which is admitted by an abstract data type. Okay, so actually also you can see that, I mean, taking exactly this definition will work also for sequential objects. It's just that there the linearization will always uh, coincide with the history itself, so there it will reduce to an inclusion. So now, I mean, just to give an example, if we consider the history on the left, this one is a valid one because if we enumerate all its linearizations, we can find, for instance, the last one, which is admitted by, uh, by the abstract data type of stacks since the, I mean, every time the values are removed in the, cor are, um, yeah, removed in the correct order. So um, now actually this ADT specifications in general will allow us to decouple the reasoning about the object implementations from the, from the client code. And actually, in general, the verification problem we reduce to these two questions, whether for every history there is a valid linearization and whether every valid linearization preserves the client invariance. And if we are interested in automation, in doing automated verification, there are typical challenges that come uh, into play in this context. One is that the abstract data types in general, they contain infinite sets of sequential histories or invocation sequences. 
And also, in general, if we want to check, for instance, the correctness of a, just of an, of an execution, of a single execution of a concurrent object, the problem in general is NP-complete, so it's intractable. And in fact, our way of dealing with this uh, challenges is to use some class of declarative specifications of abstract data types, which are sort of a, an explicit, a direct description of the set of sequential histories they admit. So this kind of specifications that are an alternative to the well-known, let's say, state-based specifications where the, each method of an abstract data type is annotated with a pre, post, and pre and post condition. And more concretely, our specifications are, for instance, first of the formulas that describe the sequences of invocations that are admitted by an abstract data type. So for instance, if we take a register, uh, the specification at some moment will say that every read returns the most recent value. And essentially, such a property will can write it as a first order formula where variables will be interpreted as invocations in the sequence, and then we'll have some uh, monadic predicates to say that an, uh, some element of this sequence is an invocation of a particular method with some particular input and output values, and also we'll have a binary predicate which gives the order in, of this, I mean, in this sequence. And uh, then we'll have also quantifiers to refer to all these uh, invocations that we have in the sequence. So actually why we have arrived to this kind of specifications is that in previous work, actually we have shown that using them will allow us to get some exponential speed ups if we are interested in bug detection for uh, concurrent objects. And the main reason was the fact that by using such specifications, the linearizations of a history can be explored using some symbolic reasoning engine instead of enumerating them explicitly one by one. So now I can state the goal of this work. So actually, I mean, in the previous work, our main concern was that writing such, speci such specifications is a complex task in general, and we cannot really ask programmers to write them for us. So then here in this work, our goal is to infer them automatically starting from some reference implementations, which, I mean, programmers can e easily write. And actually, the inference proce uh, procedure that we propose is based on two hypotheses, two main hypotheses. One is that the violations of each ADT can be decomposed in a finite set of representative patterns, and I will explain what I mean by that. And also that these patterns will manifest with few operations. And I mean, these two hypotheses are important because, for instance, the first one will allow us to get a finite some symbolic representation of an abstract data type uh, defined as some exclusion of these violation patterns, which are finite and a small set in general. And also the second one will allow us to extract them from some very, um, I mean, direct enumeration or finite enumerations of executions in this, uh, over this reference implementation. Okay, so now what are, this, what are the main challenges in uh, this work? So one is that, um, one, I mean, the, uh, one of the main contributions was to identify this, uh, I mean, the algebraic properties of an abstract data types that makes that, that allow us to characterize the infinite set of violations using a finite set of patterns. And in general, I mean, this is not obvious since, for instance, if we take a violation, and in this case, it's just a pop, an invocation of a pop method returning a value that was never inserted. And if we add operations, for instance, uh, an invocation of a push before it, then we'll get a correct execution. Okay. And also, a uh, further complication is that, in general, the um, violation patterns cannot be really insensitive to data values. Uh, because for instance, if we get an, uh, an invocation sequence which is a violation for a, for a stack because the values are not removed in the correct order, by renaming all the values that we have in our sequence of invocations to, the, to a single value, then 
the I mean the execution becomes correct. So um, okay, so now the first insight that we have is that um, actually these violation patterns must be sensitive only to relations between data values and not to the concrete instances of these values. And um, actually, this in, I mean this corresponds. I mean this means that the operations in an execution will be grouped in what we call matchings, where intuitively the operations that refer to the same value will belong to the same matching. And I mean, if we take the case of a stack, we'll say, for instance, that of an, an invocation of a of pop that returns value one will match an invocation of push that inserts value one, okay? And then, for instance, if we take a, an invocation of pop that returns the fact that the stack is empty, we'll say that this invocation matches itself. Okay, so now if we, using this concept, concept of matchings, uh, now the specifications of the abstract data types will just describe the matchings in, a, in an execution and not really the, each, I mean the individual operations with their input and output values. And if we are interested, for instance, in specifying a stack, then one property will say, that, for instance, that for every two pushes that are in some order, the matching pops should be in the reverse order. Or if we are interested in, stay, in uh, stating the property of uh, pop returning empty, we'll say that it is never preceded by an unmatched push. Okay. So now, once I explain the, explain the concept of matching, I can give a, a, an abstract version of the inference procedure that we have. And essentially, this procedure will uh, identify a finite set of executions which capture all of the reasons for which some sequence is not admitted by a given by the by the by the input reference implementation. So more concretely, we'll just enumerate sequential histories, or uh, in, I mean sequences of method invocations. And for those that are not admitted by the reference implementation, we will keep them to our set of patterns only if they are not redundant to an already existing pattern. Okay. And now, uh, once we have finished the enumeration, we'll, I mean, the output of the algorithm will be a first order formula that describes all the, all the histories, all the executions which cannot embed none of these patterns. Um, so now, in the following, I will just give some more details about the redundancy check and about a little bit about how do we build this formula at the end. So actually, the redundancy test is based on a, on, a, on a order relation between histories or executions. And redundant will mean that the, current, I mean the history under consideration is greater than some pattern. And actually, this order relation is based on some algebraic closure properties for the abstract data types. So the first property states that, in general, the executions of abstract data types are closed under removing matchings. And you may agree with me that in this execution, by removing all the push and all the pops that refer to value two, then we get something that it's still an execution of a stack, of uh, the stack uh, abstract data type. Then we have some further closure properties like closure under removing read-only operations that do not modify the state of the object. Or, clo or closure under removing the duplicates, the operations that are the invocations of the same method with the same input and output values. So based on these closure properties, uh, what we get is that uh, if we define an order relation which simply says that a history is smaller than another one if it has less matches, less duplicates, and less read-only operations, so given this order relation, we'll get that Typical ADTs, I mean, the, uh, are closed under the reverse of this order relation, which actually means that the contrapositive means that the set of violations is closed under 
disorder relation, meaning that whenever it contains a history, it contains also all the histories which are greater. In other words, we can say that this set of, I mean, the set of violations of uh, abstract data types in general is up or closed according to this, uh, um, with respect to this order relation. So actually, what an interesting fact that we proved in the, in the paper, and I will spare you the details, is that this order relation also, it is in general a well quasi-order. And I will not give the definition of a well quasi-order. Everything that it's important to, to, to remember is that from this is that the fact that this is a well quasi-order implies that every up or closed set has a finite basis, meaning a finite set of minimal elements. Now, and now since the set of violations is up or closed set, this will mean that the set of violations has a, in general, the, the set of violations which can be infinite has a finite set of element, uh, minimal elements according to this order relation. And this corresponds, this is a formalization of the first hypothesis that I mentioned in the beginning. So, okay, so now the algorithm is very simple, so it will simply enumerate invocation sequences and every time it will check whether the, the history under consideration is greater than what it has already kept in, his, uh, in this state. And if it is so, then it will throw it away. Otherwise, it will add it to the, to the set of patterns. And actually, just to say a little bit about experiments, I mean, for the abstract data types that we consider, like stacks, queues, uh, and so on, I mean, uh, typically, we had to enumerate only invocation sequences up to size four. Okay, so this gives the, I mean, the second hypothesis, the fact that these violation patterns can be extracted from, I mean, with few operations. And just to give you the, an example of uh, what are these violation patterns in some concrete case. So if we take the case of, an, of a queue, then we'll have several patterns. One, for instance, is the fact that if we, take, if we have an execution where we have a single DQ returning a value that was never inserted, that was never there, this is a violation and a violation pattern. Then we'll have one that says, if you have in a sequence a DQ before the EQ that inserts that value, this is also a violation and so on. Then we'll have like seven or so of uh, these patterns. So now, given these uh, this violation patterns, these executions that somehow give all the reasons for which a, queue is, uh, a, a sequence is not admitted by a queue, now we'll simply build the first of the formula that will describe all the histories that cannot embed one of these uh, small patterns that we have seen in the previous slide. So basically, I mean, this formula will take every pattern Basically, every element of this pattern will correspond to an existentially quantified variables, uh, variable, and then we'll take the negation of all this, and this will be the, the, the formula at the end that will describe actually now the, the executions which are admitted by the abstract data type. Okay, so actually it will be all to describe all the histories that are greater than uh, uh, one of these... Uh, that are not great, that are greater yet yeah, than one of these patterns. Okay, so in conclusion, so we'll, I mean, I tried, I present you a, a procedure for inferring logical characterizations of abstract data types, where, so one of the main concepts was using the, the match, which, using the concept of matching, which allow us to abstract data values. Then another important fact was identifying some algebraic properties which allowed us to somehow describe uh, the, set, the infinite set of violations in a finite way. And also what we, in our experiments, what we have shown is that actually all these patterns can be captured using, I mean, uh, yeah, from a finite enumeration with few operations. And uh, this uh, actually means that the procedure we propose uh, also in practice is efficient. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thanks.
Hi, so I uh, just had a question on this matching. So the matching itself, the formula that describes the matching itself is not learned, right? It's not? It's not learned, it's not synthesized. Oh. It's given. Yeah. Um, so, right, uh, and uh, so, so some data types, like, I don't know, like for instance, uh, you may match something after some number of counts, for instance. I mean, increments and a count, like you get, you get the size, right? So then you, it, ma it has to match not a single operation, has to match like a bunch of operations. Yeah, yeah, then I mean, so. yeah, for the moment we are, I mean, what we had at least in our experiment, experiments were uh, sort of matching schemes where the, I mean, we had only equalities between values. Mm -hmm. So basically like one operation matched another one only if there was some equality between input or output values. So, and actually we also have some sort of more general um, I mean, solution for trying to synthesize some matching schemes using uh, SMT solvers, but it's, it's still at the beginning. I mean, we don't have really an experimental evaluation for this. And um, now, yeah, I agree that there is this other problem because here we were <coughs> somehow assuming that every time like the, the, the set of operations which are included in a matching is bounded, and I agree that this other case where you have counters in which we'll have like, a, I mean, the matchings in self, themselves will somehow include a non-bounded number of operations in general. We don't cover for the moment, but I agree that it's an interesting question. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk, very interesting. I just wanted to ask again about the motivation of the work, because if you want to use these specs for refinement, probably the original sequential implementation is more useful. Uh, what it, so, what so actually, so actually, we didn't use it for refinement. It was used like for the problem of given a, an execution of a concurrent object, so a fixed execution, deciding whether this is linearizable. I mean, whether it is valid. So then the problem is, I mean, here the, I mean, it's just to check whether there exists a linearization which satisfies some properties. So this is the problem we are trying to solve. So now you synthesize this formula and checking it is, how efficient is that? I mean, Given a trace, how, how efficient is checking this I formula? I mean, in general, you can state this, the existence of this linearization and so on as a Boolean formula. So in general, it will be NP. I mean, the complexity will be NP. But I mean, what we have shown in, uh, in our work is that in many cases, actually, you can restrict the sub solvers not let them do like uh, branching. So you, they, you just restrict them to do Boolean propagation and that's all. And you are still able to uh, detect most of the, the violations that uh, occur in practice. So in theory, the complexity is not reduced, but in practice it helps a yeah. lot because yeah. of the symbolic yeah. checking. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'm curious about the scope of uh, specifications that can be uh, written in that way. So for instance, if I, let's, let's take the OCaml uh, the library, uh, standard library of, uh, of, uh, uh, of sets and maps. There is an operation that takes the minimal and maximal elements of a set. Is this I don't think this is specifiable inside your framework, is it? Uh, no, probably there you will need some second order variables, yeah, this yeah. is what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, we didn't investigate. I mean, in general, you could, I mean, the approach we give, the, give here is, uh, let's say, general enough to, I mean, I mean, in general, you can use any logic, I mean, but still in practice, if you really want to do, to implement something there, I will assume that having some second order logic formulas and so on will pose some technicalities that, yeah, may be difficult. So. Uh, 